Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, real quick before we get started on the show, I'm just going to talk about Treeline Academy. You've heard me say it. I can't even tell you how many times. Uh, Mark Livesey is treelineacademy.net. That's treelineacademy.net. Sign up. Use the promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20 bucks. Can't say it enough. It's awesome. Amazing. Most comprehensive e-scouting course out there. Check it out for yourself. Sign up. Use promo code PC2020. And now let's get to the show. All right. So I'm sitting here and I am talking to Gary Blessing and Ron Slifer. Did I say that right, Ron? Yes, you did. You got it. Okay. And kind of got a pretty interesting topic because um, I did an episode a while back with Gary and we talked about his tracking dog and how amazing it was and helpful and kind of, you know, a unique person to call to to recover a deer. And um, you guys have kind of run into some bumps along the road so you guys came up with um, a tracking organization, right? We'll call it a trackers network um, that that you came up with. And we're going to talk about that. But first, let's kind of get Ron. Ron, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit and tell everybody who you are and what you're about? Sure, sure. Yeah, my name is Ron Slifer. Uh, been tracking deer with my dog, Dio, for nine years now. Uh, before that nine years, I was an avid bow hunter for 26 years. Uh, that last year of hunting, I shot a big deer and lost it. So, and it's, it happened throughout the years, a couple other times, but that one really ate at me. And I thought, you know, I've heard about guys doing this with a dog. So I got a dog, the bloodhound and uh, Dio's his name. And actually I hung up my bow nine years ago and do this full time, track full time with my dog, just totally gave up the hunting and devoted all my time for tracking with the dog to help hunters out. So, uh, lo- located down in East Central Illinois. Uh, Watson, Illinois, just south of Effingham. Most people know where Effingham is. Right. Uh, yep. So, um, it's obviously, I mean, it kind of struck you enough that you, I mean, you hung up your bow or were you just kind of like, you know, I've killed enough deer or yeah. was it you just, you realized the potential well, it, there and you wanted to help people? Of, yeah, a little of both. I, I The first year that I got in with, with the dog, I tried to do both hunt and track with the dog. And word kind of got out about the dog, and we was finding a few deer back then. And I, I kind of made that conscious decision. I said, to have what I thought would be, make the best dog or a good dog, I just needed to devote all my time to that and not try to do both. It was hard to, hard for me to do both. And being I was, I'd already hunt for 26 years, I was kind of getting burnt out. I still, I kind of miss it in some ways, but this is my new passion in life, so to speak. Uh, and I get a lot of joy out of it. Right. And I mean, I, I know from, you know, talking to Gary and seeing diesel work and, and the way it happens, I mean, there's such a bond there that you almost, it seems like anyway, that you almost just want to keep continuing on with that and, and, you know, pursuing that passion because you see how passionate the dog is about it and to watch that dog work and know that you brought it up to do that. That's kind of an amazing yeah. thing and a, a pretty cool bond to see between the, the, yeah, and that, that's a very good word. You know, a lot of trackers will talk about that, especially the guys that track on lead, like we do. You know, that that bonds important to form with that that dog. You know, because you're you're a two man team basically. It's just not always the dog. It's it's you as well. And and to take a dog and train that dog, like I said, and get that satisfaction of watching him work, it, it's very rewarding. Yeah, but right. it it does does take tons and tons and hundreds of man hours to do it. You know, it, it takes a lot of devotion. Yeah, I can believe that for sure. Yeah. Um, Gary, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, Gary Blessing. I track with uh, my Bavarian mountain hound named Diesel. Um, Diesel's uh, entering his fourth full season. Um, Much like Ron, I think, and and a lot of other trackers. Um, And I told you before when I spoke with you, Luke, but... um, I just got to the point when my bow hunting career that it just, it wasn't what it was. Um, and I was killing deer and it, it, 
it didn't make me feel like it did. Um, so I was getting a little burnout. And at that point in time, my wife was getting into bow hunting and I think a long story short, she, um, I was in the tree with her. She shoots a, a really nice deer. Um, and you know, it's probably liver, maybe liver gut and it's high and it's just a nightmare scenario without a dog. And I called around and couldn't find a dog. And, and, uh, we ended up losing that deer and it irked me so bad that I said, well, I'm never going to let that happen again. And so I bought a dog. So, um, and the, and the rest has been history. <laughs> yeah, no, it's pretty cool. And if anybody hasn't listened to that, go ahead and check out that episode. I don't remember the episode number, but, um, you could definitely find it. And it's got, uh, I believe it's got Gary and, and diesel on the cover art. So you can find it pretty easily. Yeah. Um, so I kind of want to discuss this cause I think it's pretty important that people understand just because you find a tracker, you're not exactly finding an actual tracker that is trained and has experience doing this and they could charge you money and different things. And it kind of, um, could be a bad experience for, for everybody involved. And, uh, so let's kind of roll into what you're doing and like what kind of dog is the best dog for a tracking dog? Does it really matter? All those kind of things. Can you guys kind of touch base on that? Sure. sure. Go, go ahead, Garrett. No, I was just going to say, um, you know, the, you know, Luke, what you're referring to is the Illinois deer trackers network is what, um, we're just getting off the ground now. And, and that's, <clears throat> that was, um, um, started for many different reasons, but, um, <clears throat> um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an undertaking. It, really what the organization is, is, um, is a self-governing body of trackers um, that want to make sure that hunters are getting, they know what is coming out to help them. It seems like there's a lot of, uh, as, as the popularity of tracking increases, um, there are some people that, um, are taking advantage of the situation a little bit and claiming they're one thing when they're really not, um, charging a bunch of money to be there and, um, really not offering the service that they're charging for. And it's, it, it's, it's not necessarily common by any means, but, uh, the more people that we see getting into the sport, um, the more it's going to happen. So there was a need for sort of a self-governing body. Um, to regulate ourselves, um, apply some rules, um, and, you know, so hunters can actually know what they're expecting of, of us and, in a good tracking team. Um, so in a nutshell, that's, that's what the network is about. There's, there's quite a bit more to it, but so in let's, a nutshell, that's what let's kind of roll into that then Gary. Cause I mean, while, while you're talking about it, it's fresh on everybody's mind here. Like, what what are some of these rules and why are they in place? Um, you know why why is there a need for a self governing body? What let's kind of talk a little bit more about that. Well, <clears throat> right now it's it's actually a free for all. Um, you know if you can you can advertise your tracking services any number of ways. You know Facebook, Instagram, word of mouth, uh, passing business cards around. Um, or you can join a network like United Blood Trackers. Um, but, um, you know, there, what we're attempting to do and, and really where the need is, is, is again, you know, a guy is free to do, a tracker is free to track however they want and run their sort of mini business however they want. Um, and like I said, some are, you know, sort of, um, not delivering what they say they're going to going to deliver. And it's really bad for hunting in the long run. Um, you know, because it's, it's deterring some hunters from using a tracker again. And that's, that's the big problem. Um, you know, when one guy, you know, does a hunter bad, it makes us all look bad. Absolutely. So. You know, going back to the nine years that I've been doing this, when, when I first started, I always heard, you know, they didn't think it was legal back then. A lot of guys didn't know it was legal. And through social media and stuff, people have found out through the years that it has become legal. And I've just seen that explosion going on. And I, me and Gary's talked about that a lot. But I, I bet you this year we're going to see a lot, a lot more new guys out there doing it. You know, 
And if those inexperienced guys are, are less than less than truthful people are out there doing things to hunters like that, claiming they got a good dog and come out and don't don't do a well job, not what they are, it's gonna kinda give us all a bad name. Yeah. And that 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 was always a big concern of mine. So what like you, you guys talk about this do a bad job or like charging money or something like that. Typically what does one charge to track a dog or to track a deer? I mean, is that, is there kind of like a standardized thing across the board or how does that normally go? How does somebody know if they're getting ripped off? <laughs> that's, that's kind of like Gary said, a free for all. It, there's no standard to that. I mean, some guys charge a set amount, some guys tip only, uh, you know, just because a guy doesn't charge doesn't mean he has a good dog. There's a guy that we know, don't, don't we, Gary, in Indiana that doesn't charge a dime. He's probably got one of the best dogs in the nation. So there's there's really no standard to the charge. You know, there's there's a whole other side of that too, Luke, is, um, you know, like Ron just alluded to, you can, you can charge a fee um, or not charge a fee, obviously. Um, and be good or bad either way. You know, there's, we know some people that charge a pretty good fee, um, and their dogs are, they, they just don't have a very good reputation. Let's put it that way. Um, so, but you know, a lot of guys, Luke will charge to show, charge to find, um, some will charge a set fee. Some guys charge 80 cents a mile. Um, some guys take tips, um, and there's even like Ron alluded to. There's there's one guy in Indiana that absolutely refuses anything. So, um, you know that's so yeah. That's that's basically how the I, financial I mean, end of the structure. I, I can understand like um, you know if they're working on tips or something. You obviously want to you want to give them something and make it worth their while for coming out or else when you call them, they probably are going to ignore your call and go to somebody else's call first. Right. I mean, <laughs> hey, we've got a list of those. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're on I, our I, phones. I'm, I'm telling you, they're on our phones. Do not track. So when it comes yeah, up, I've, <laughs> I've got an asterisk that I always use next to the contact. That's my indicator. <laughs> so and it's not necessarily about money there, Luke, though. No, um, I, I can understand you know, that. A lot of times it's not about, cause that's, that's not really why we do what we do. It's not about the money at all. But so I can understand there's probably, you know, a a chronic crippler, we'll call them, um, (laughs) that keeps doing it. And every time they wound, you know, three, four, five deer season or something, they're calling you up. And I mean, at that point, I mean, is it almost enabling a hunter to go and do that? Or is it, I mean, that's kind of a tough position to be in as a tracker. That, That is, that really is. Is is that like a common thing with some hunters or is that, I mean, it, you hate you to know, admit that, right? But I've, it, it, the, the serial wounders um, often end up being too, uh, um, too embarrassed and they stop calling. So I make it a point where, you know, if a guy's like nervous in the truck about, Hey, you know, this is the fourth time we've met each other. And I've, I've got a couple guys like that. Um, and you know, I can see him getting nervous at the truck, you know, it's like, and, I, and I, I try to reassure him and say, hey, look, this is not, you know, we need to solve the problem. We need to work on the problem, but don't be afraid. I don't want to leave a dead deer in the woods. I don't care if it's your first or your 10th. Let's, let's help you get through this. Let's, and let's go find get it. Deer. And, and then you can tell yeah. me how much your arrow weighs, how much FOC you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's talk about some other things here. Are you using mechanicals and do you have like a 200 grain arrow that's, uh, <laughs> because I mean, I, uh... let's face it, that does play into it. And a lot of people don't think about it. And I remember, and you and I talked about this a little bit, we alluded to it in our previous podcast, Gary, but the truth of the matter is, is everybody is cutting things down. They were going lighter. They were going to overdraws so they could get even shorter arrows and make them oh, lighter yeah. just to chase yep. speed. But what good is speed if there's no momentum behind it? So, I mean, that is kind of important. So if anybody, uh, I recommend you refer them a little bit to maybe like a ranch ferry or something that's kind of on the extreme end of the spectrum. But, yep. um, you know, I mean... <laughs> It's something that needs to be addressed and talked about. For yeah, sure. I, we try not to preach, though. I mean, we, we honestly don't. There's not a tracker out there that, that wants to be 
a preacher and some of us by the by the end of november we get a little bit shorter fuse and we tend to preach more by then but um but Gary, we try I'm not pretty to sure, i'm pretty sure things. i called you in october i'm pretty sure it was <laughs> like fairly early october and uh I, I do recall you did ask me, you're like, well, what's your arrow set up? What, what do you, how, well, how many pounds you pull? What do you, what, what's your arrow weigh? How, do you know how much do you have front of center? How much is, what kind of broadheads are you using? Those were questions that came up. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. We won't talk about rage though on the podcast. It's not, so it's let's kind of, um, I'm kind of curious about like recovery rates then. Is that like, a, um, like a guaranteed thing what's an actual percentage that like you know a tracker especially somebody that like would join the like a tracker network or something like that how how does that typically happen what what's what's the rates there so me and gary talked about that earlier today there is a national average for tracking on lead versus off lead there's two different types of tracking here in illinois we track on lead only that's the way the law is set up and that national average, Gary, it's what, around 35%, somewhere around there? 35 to 40%, give or take. Yeah. So in another state off lead, they're obviously going to find more deer. But here in Illinois, like I said, we have to stick on the lead. So we're going to find less deer. We're going to restrict that dog because they're dragging us along with them versus a dog at their free range. Yeah. I mean, is that um, like a common practice in most states or is that not a common practice then where they're actually on lead? It, it seems like most of the, the northern states, central northern states uh, are on lead track and more the southern states, they tend to be off lead. And what, I mean, do you think like the percentage that you guys mentioned, 35, 40% recovery rate, is that because some of the deer are only like slightly wounded and they're not mortally wounded or something like that is that kind of a like a semi-safe assurance to think that or is it just because of you know... pretty much pretty much the case every deer we track you know a lot of them still alive you know they're seen later on trail cameras or the, perhaps they might expire a week or two later you know we're generally tracking within two days after the shot you know day after or two days later but yeah, most of the time, if it's not found, that's probably the case. The deer are still alive and on its feet if you've got a, a trained, experienced dog. Yeah, because I, and, I, and I think. Go ahead, Luke. Oh, I was just going to say, I recall um, Gary saying one of the first things he said is most likely we'll know within the first couple minutes of this track how it's going to go. I don't know if he told me that after or before, but um, I, I do remember he said something like that. Is that, is that pretty common? That's pretty common for the guys that, that know their dog and have been with their dog for a while. You, you can tell that the dog learns over time. Hey, when I smell this and w what I'm getting through my nose, it smells like this. Then I generally find the deer and they've got one set of body languages. If, and, and again, they'll eventually learn, Hey, when this, I smell this. I don't find this deer. This track is just not any fun anymore to me because I know I'm probably not going to find it. Um, so they have a different center mannerisms. So if a handler knows his dog well enough, you can say, hey, this dog's, you know, he's telling me this deer's dead. You know, so a lot of us, um, you know, that, that really started even a couple of years ago for me, but really last year, I could almost tell within the first 30 or 40 yards with a decent es estimation that we're probably going to find the deer or not find the deer just by the way diesel goes it's just it's an amazing thing if you spend so much time behind your dog you know what that dog is thinking and he knows what you're thinking you're a well-oiled machine and that's you know so that's that's sort of tends to be how it goes with most most guys if they take enough tracks and find enough deer is that kind of the same would you say that's pretty much the same then ron Oh, yeah, I absolutely nailed it. When I first started tracking like nine years ago, like I said, I would read where some experienced trackers claim that, that they knew whether the deer is dead or alive. I, at that time, I thought, oh, that's a bunch of bull. <laughs> but I've seen that transition. And my dog, you know, like Gary said, the more you're behind your dog, you'll, you'll know. You'll know those mannerisms. 
stuff and you got that bond and yeah it, it's definitely true everything that gary said to the outsider they don't get that but these guys that, that are out there all the time with their dog and doing this they know the dog knows they know yeah you know getting back to your let me loop back to your question a little bit though luke is um you know that 66 percent were that we don't find um those the majority of those deer are not dead but there's a majority of those deer that could be dead that are on the other side of a fence yeah in the bottom of the river um you know on land that you can't go on uh, you know whatever the case may be i mean i ran into a, a of an issue last year where the terrain stopped us of all things. I, I just couldn't go. Um, but, um, so, but there is once in a while, and I, I think more people need to talk about this is that once in a while as trackers and as dogs, we're going to screw up and we're going to leave one. Um, that's just the nature of the beast where we're only human. Uh, we, you know, it's a dog and a guy and we make the best decisions that we can, but, you know, trackers aren't perfect. Dogs aren't perfect. Dogs are going to have a bad day at work, just like we do. And, you know, so that sort of that, that 66% now uh, for a veteran team, um, it would be awful shocking to me. It wouldn't necessarily be shocking to me, but if, if you know, Ron calls me this year and says, Hey, I learned, I learned we left one. And it's like, oh man, that, that really sucks. But it's not like it happens all the time. It might happen yeah. once, you know, to a guy or three or four times over a career. It's just, it, it's just going to happen. So that's part of that 66% though. Yeah. Luke. So I'm kind of curious. So you guys, um, you, you formed the deer trackers network and, um, you kind of said why you did it, but what, um, I mean, what kind of benefits, what, what guarantees that somebody's, you know, going to get like a reputable, um, like a reputable tracker if, if they, you know, use the network. Go, go ahead, Gary. Well, you know, I think <clears throat> what we like to, how we like to think about it is, is we're as trackers, we're doing the homework for the hunter. We are, um, uh, every tracking team that's a member, they have to complete an application. Um, that application asks a lot of questions about their experience, um, how old their dog is, what kind of dog is it, how many tracks you take, how many recoveries do you have. So what we're trying to do is, um, you know, put not necessarily quality teams, but uh, different levels of teams. Um, and, and the hunter, when they call us, they know exactly what they're going to get. So, for example, we have three different tiers of trackers. We've got first year trackers, trackers in training and veterans. And, you know, the guys are going to be able to go to the network. We've got an interactive map. You're going to be able to go to that interactive map. They're going to be able to click on, you know, whoever's in the area. Let's say that Ron comes up. You know, they're going to see Ron, his phone number. He's going to see that he's a veteran tracker, what his fees are, um, <clears throat> or if he takes tips and when he tracks. So uh, there's going to be a profile there for them. And, and really, it, when we've got a set of bylaws within the network that we are holding ourselves accountable to. So what that means is, is um, again, going back to that, that self-governing issue um, we're asking teams to follow our guidelines our rules our bylaws our conduct um, the way that we're going to handle ourselves and what the hunter would expect uh, when they call us so um, that's that's really the benefit to the hunter right there is is we're doing the homework and we're telling you hey this guy's a first year tracker here's what to expect this guy is maybe one to two years um, um, into tracking with a dog and here's what you can expect and here's your veteran guys. Um, so that's, that's a huge, huge benefit. It's a confidence booster because right now guys don't know who they're calling. They've got no idea. I can tell them I found a thousand deer. They don't know. So we're, we're doing that homework for them. And um, that's, they, it, it's a trusted source. 
Let's put it that way. Right. So, like, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you remember, but I was talking to you, telling you about how I have a cousin who lives in Texas, and he went on, at, what was it, the Blood Trackers United, or um, is that what it is? United Blood Trackers. United Blood Trackers, and went on there, and two or three guys he couldn't get. The other guy he called, the guy's like, yeah, it'll be $250. I'll be out in about an hour. And the guy gets out there, and he says he gets this little old dog out that's like a, like a terrier or something, you know. And uh, <clears throat> he gets on it and does the track for about 100 yards and just stops. And the guy goes, yeah, you don't have anything here. And that was it. Paid him 250 bucks, and the guy jets out of there. And he's like, huh? I don't know if... Uh, you know, I got scammed or that, you know, the deer's still alive or whatever. Now, thankfully the deer was still alive. It was kind of high in the brisket and it lived and he has trail cam pictures of it, um, throughout the entire season. Um, and it happened pretty early on, but to this day, he still doesn't know, you know, how that <laughs> happened or whatever. I mean, is that yeah. what you guys are kind of working towards is, um, actually knowing, like you said, knowing what you're getting and not, um, not not just you know having some random guy with a little terrier show up or whatever yep, yep. so yeah um, exactly I mean, yeah. that's that's really what we're getting at is in other words you know just just being honest with being very transparent with the hunters um and and because really that's that's who we're we're responsible to and that's who we answer to um as a group um you know the service that we provide is you know, I mean, nobody's going to die over it, hopefully, but I mean, this is serious business to us. Um, we, um, if, if you're into tracking at all and, and you care about what you do, um, we've got a very large emotional attachment to what we do. And it's not just the fun, excitement stuff at the track, but, you know, there's a lot of other things that it's the relationship with your dog and the, the exercise and the camaraderie with the hunter and all this stuff. I mean, that's so, um, <clears throat> anyway so i hope that <laughs> yeah no it, i mean it does um it i'm just kind of like so i mean say say i wanted to get a dog i probably won't because i'm still not at that point in my bow hunting career yet but um you know if i did or you know somebody else that i know and i want to tell them hey you know there's this network that you could join and you know people can find you what would they do to join your network and try and um you know become one of the Illinois deer trackers network. Again, go ahead, Gary. you've been, you've been working hard on this. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, basically what it is, is we, we have them fill out an application, ask them a bunch of questions. We, uh, we'll, we'll look at that application from, uh, from a board of directors standpoint. There's, there's three of us that are on the board. Um, we'll look at the application and we'll see what their experience is and, if number one, if we, if we think that they're a person that we want to take on, um, and then number two, if so, what category do they fall into? Are they first year or are they in training yet, or are they a seasoned team? Um, so, and then, you know, once the application is approved, we've got an interactive map that you can actually, um, uh, that you can join. We'll put you on the interactive map. So uh, a hunter can go to um, the Illinois Deer Trackers Network Facebook page and group. Um, they can access the interactive map there and find a tracker in their area. But um, so um, so they can be listed. A tracker can be listed on that map um, for a twenty dollar fee. Um, it helps us pay for the su subscription for the map. Um, you know, and then they're they're in the network. They show up on the map and, and they're good to go. So um... that's, so that's basically how you would join. Is there like any subscription or anything that like uh, a user would have to pay or anything like that to, to get this app or anything like that? How, how does that work? No, nope, it's absolutely free. So we, <laughs> we operate completely off of um, Facebook, and, you know, Facebook page and a Facebook group. And again, the Facebook page is, you know, United or I'm sorry, Illinois Deer Trackers Network. Um, and uh, from the page, if you go to the page, you can actually like the group from there. But um, basically what that, that, that um, Facebook group is for um, is that's really where the magic happens. 
um, come season, you're going to, you're going to hear a lot of talk about tracks and recoveries. And, you know, we're going to have hunters calling in saying, Hey, I need a tracker in X County or X town or whatever it is. And that's, that's the discussion that's going to happen, you know, starting in October. So is it only on Facebook then, or if we'll say somebody doesn't have Facebook or something like that, would they still be able to um, somehow find it or, or connect to it? No. Um, <laughs> now next year, next <laughs> year we're looking in <laughs> next year, we're looking into uh, a website, but we just, we just didn't have the time this year. So that, that could be a possibility, but, but again, you lose that interactive, you know, with the Facebook group, but yeah. So Most guys it, got Facebook. It's kind of got me curious then. And like, um, you, you guys are forming this, is this something entirely new or is it something that maybe like people had in, in the past, maybe not in Illinois, but I mean, is there other things out there? Say, say you got somebody that lives in Wisconsin or, you know, Indiana or something like that. Is that something that they'll be able to do? Or are you guys going to go over there to Indiana or whatever? I'm sure you probably don't want to drive no. that far. Well, like, like you mentioned earlier, there is the United Blood Trackers, the UBT. That's a national organization. But all the neighboring states around Illinois, they've got this already started up and going, a uh, blood tracking organization. And some states have two. Okay. But Illinois, we we just been kind of dragging our feet on it, and, we're, and this was the year to do it. We decided we had to do it, jump on the bandwagon, and hopefully we can get this thing up and going and iron all the bugs out and get it, get it rolling really good. Nice. Yeah, there's... And I think, Luke, what you're going to find, you know, UBT is on a national level. I think what you're going to find is every state is going to have their own network. It's it's a ton of time and work and dedication to make it work. Um, but a lot of the states, Michigan, Wisconsin, um, our, um, Oklahoma, Missouri, they are experiencing very, very good results with similar associations slash networks. Um, we're doing the same thing. Um, we've copied a lot of the model that's already there. We've injected some of the stuff that we think would work better for us, but um, this is not something new. Um, a lot of states are doing this, um, and it's it is just hunters are finding it very helpful. Um, and um and trackers like it too because frankly we get more tracks and we get to find more deer yeah. so it's it's good and for it's, both and it's a and it's a way for us us trackers to network with one another and get to know each other you know that's how me and gary kind of got to know each other he lives quite a few miles away and then we can also help these new guys out start and they you know we can maybe mentor or, or give them tips or whatever and, and help them out on the way so so is that it, like it helps the tracker would that be part of like the benefit of joining the network as far as being a tracker yourself then? I mean, um, to, to get that mentorship as well. Yeah, that, and you know, you're going to pick up general knowledge and, and just get your name out there as well too. You know, people's going to know, you know, your, your, what you do anyway. So, so do you, are, and you know, look, look to that. Let me add to that. Yeah. There, there is a, I think every, state that has a network or an association also has an annual seminar track fest whatever um that is designed to bring in existing handlers new handlers you know start training um, from the start or start training you know from the beginning you know offer there's there's trackers that'll do seminars on you know um, you know gear and line handling and how to read your dog. And those are the kind of things that in network trackers would be, you know, it's, it's extremely beneficial from a, from a tracker standpoint. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for stealing my question there, Gary. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> so what, what's, what's kind of, <laughs> what's different? Uh, um, what's kind of different about like, cause I know a guy that does, he has cadaver dogs to where, they go and they track and they, you know, obviously recover bodies and all that kind of stuff. Is there that much of a difference? I mean, between a deer tracking dog and that. Well, Ron, Ron has a search and rescue dog. I mean, yeah. is yeah, that I because I mean, I don't know. I mean, cause a lot of people would probably think, Oh, you can take a search and rescue dog. That's a cadaver dog or something like that and do that. I mean, is that kind of like a so, common misconception or myth that you might hear about? Some people might, 
some people might cross train, but usually those dogs are scent specific. They train them for one certain scent, uh, scent. and a human dead scent or a cadaver smell, it's going to be way different than a deer. So, and it's totally different, you know, so generally not, I, I would, I myself wouldn't cross train a dog because I wouldn't want to confuse a dog on, when I was out working or whatever. So you never know if he was out tracking a deer and there might be a dead body out there by chance or something, you know, so what's a dog, what's a dog going to go to the deer or the dead body, you know, dog very forbid. true. You know, so it's, it's, it's very, deer. very scent, scent, scent specific. specific. <laughs> is there, I mean, is there anything else like that that, you know, people probably come up with or some kind of harebrained, you know, misconceptions or anything like that? Oh, yeah. A lot, a lot of hunters think just because they get a dog out there, they're going to find the deer every time. And that's that's just not the case. You know, like we talked about earlier, a lot of times that deer wasn't hit as well as what they thought it was, you know, and that. It, that just ain't the case. A dog ain't the miracle thing. You know, you've got to you've got to kill the deer first, and then get you a good trained dog out there to find it. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I get asked a lot. I get asked a lot. You know, oh, what kind of dog do you have? I've got a Bavarian Mountain Hound. Oh, you know, because nobody's heard of it. Um, you know, I mean, the tracking community obviously does, but no hunters heard heard of it. But they're like. You know, most of them are like, "Oh, I thought you had a bloodhound." And they're like, "This," they're disappointed. I'm like, <laughs> "My dog's pretty good too." You know, he's not a bloodhound, but he's, he's pretty good. And that's funny because Ron has like ten bloodhounds. Um, yeah. But you know, that's another definitely another myth that that, that we see. We see all kind of dogs. I mean, from mutts to bloodhounds to pugs to they all find deer. So that yeah, I always say the key the the key word is the best dog out there is a trained dog. It's it's not a bloodhound, you know, or or whatever. It's a trained dog is is your best dog out there. So nope. so the guy that came showed up could have been a legitimate tracker with the with the he little, could, he could have very well been yeah schnauzer yeah. or whatever yeah. he had. <laughs> well, and, hey, and, and, like Gary, like Gary said, a lot of people have that image of a bloodhound being the top dog, and like Gary said, I've got ten dogs. Out of those dogs, I would only trust two of those dogs out there because of the training. Holy crap. <laughs> Rob, we lost you there a minute. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and to go back to that, you, you know, we've got a, I don't know, a 10 pound pug in Oklahoma to, that walks up on deer. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all about training. It's, you know, that's one of the other distinctions with the network is, you know, w- we've got guys in the network or trackers in the network and girls um you know that we we know that are working their dog because we're working with them um you know we can keep not necessarily tabs on them but we we know what if guys are putting in the work if they're not um but um any dog can track you can train you can go to the pound and if you want to put in enough time you're going to get a service serviceable tracking dog so so where does like where 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 do you guys meet up and train and um, all that kind of stuff? I mean, is it all over? Is it like sanctioned type events? Is it, uh, you know, trophies or medals, or is it just uh, a great group of guys getting together and, you know, towards a common goal working and uh, training dogs or what's the, what's that like? So, so what it is for, for a lot of us is uh, one of the buddy trackers might just call and say, Hey, won't we set up tracks for you this weekend? We'll run a bunch of tracks with the dogs. A group of us will get together. But like Gary said, our, our kind of goal is going to be is to have that yearly track fest or an event where everybody from the state, all the trackers can come and meet and, and learn a lot. Yeah. No, that, yeah, I, I think, think that would be a good thing. I think Missouri last year, I, I, I could have had this way wrong, but I think there was 40 some trackers at the Missouri event last year. Um, so that's a real good event. Yeah. Oh, yep. So, um, it's, you guys talking about this, I mean, and that's something that, uh, you're potentially going to do, but how many, how many trackers do you have within the Illinois deer trackers network right now? Well, right now we just launched, um, I don't know what date this is going to air, but we just launched three days ago, four days ago. Um, and we're, I think we're over 700 uh, likes right now. That's, and again, that's hunters and trackers and, and both. But um, right now there's uh, 12 trackers in the network um, that's already been through the process, been accepted. 
Um, and I think I've got another seven pending right now, um, trackers that we have to look at. Um, okay. So there's, there's potentially 20, you know, or so uh, trackers. And right now, and we're only three or four days into this. My anticipation is, again, I could be way off in this, but I think by the time season rolls around, there's going to be 35 or 40 tracking teams in the network. How far does be my a, guess. a tracker like typically travel um, if, if one's going to find one and there's not one exactly that close to them on a map or something like that? How, how does that kind of go down? I mean, do you guys have your own individual rule of thumb or, or uh, what's that look like? Go ahead, Garrett. Um, <clears throat> I think I think a lot of it is is you know what kind of time do we have? What what time of uh, uh, season is it? Um, you know, if it's October and it's you know we've we've gone four or five days without a track. Um, you know, if a guy calls that's eighty miles away, you're going to be like, hey, yeah, I'll come because you because <laughs> you're Jones in the track. Um, and if you've got the time, you know, you know, so a guy might travel further, um, you know, but if, if November comes and, and we're literally getting 40 and 50 and 60 calls a day, um, and we've already got four tracks lined up, we're not going to go very far, um, no. just because we can help three hunters by the time it takes us to drive two hours, one way and two hours back, we could have found three deer in that time. So yeah, simple, it really all depends. Simple matter of logistics that time of year. Mm -hmm. So like with that being said, then, I mean, is there like, I mean, what's the most number of tracks you've ever done? And at what point do you have to just say, Hey, my dog's tired or, you know, can't, can't do it anymore. What's that typically look like? <laughs> Ron, go ahead. This is all you buddy. <laughs> yeah. Well, last year was a phenomenal day for us last year, Friday the 13th during run. <laughs> uh, we actually traveled quite a bit, did nine tracks and recovered nine deer. And, and that's just absolutely unheard of. It just, everything was stacked on our side. And the main thing was on that, I mentioned earlier, we was tracking dead deer on all nine of those tracks, except one. And we had dispatch that deer, which was legal, but, uh, yeah, not nine was our limit for, for one day in the track and very, very exhausting and very wore out. <laughs> so, I mean, does your dog, I, I mean, nine deer depending on how far you went say you went you know 20 something or 30 something miles at that point i mean I, i'm sure your dog's conditioned and stuff but at some point i mean do they need like recovery he, days and he stuff like that he takes yeah he takes advantage that and the reason we did that track that day like we did we heard on the forecast that the following day was going to be full bore rain all day 100 percent chance of rain so we just decided we weren't going to track in the rain and we decided we're just running that hard and he's experienced enough. He takes advantage of every time he gets in between tracks, he knows he's going to get in there and take a nap in the back seat of the truck. <laughs> and we feed him well. He eats Casey's donuts and pizza just like I do too. So, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? He's 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 got the routine down. They these dogs know this routine. They know they know when you're on the phone talking to a hunter. They know hey, it's about go time. You know he's talking about a track. They they just they're in key to this stuff. <laughs> you know. But that's the truth. He he does eat Casey's pizza anyway. I don't I don't share the donuts. I keep them for myself. So yeah, that was one of the craziest things to me because tracking deer prior to ever having a tracking dog track a deer for me, the fact that you said, you know, doesn't track in the rain, that's because mostly because you guys just don't want to be in the rain tracking. Not necessarily yeah, yeah. that the dog can't track in the rain because as uh <laughs> Gary proved that as it was about to downpour and he's like, Well, you know, if you really want to track in the rain, we can, but I don't really want to get wet. Um, I think I'm going to go get some lunch. And I'm like, what? Like, is this guy freaking serious right now? Like, you just get here and you're going to turn around and leave and I'm stressing out about this. And uh, he's like, don't worry, it's fine. It'll be fine. And then he gets back and he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, you know, they're not tracking from blood. Like a lot of probably a common misconception that people have that they think that that you know they're tracking that deer's blood but they're not <laughs> can you guys kind of talk about that a little bit actually you know a dog learns to track whatever by whatever means necessary um from broken vegetation to hair dander saliva 
body fluids, blood, inner digital scent in the bottom of their feet, breath, um, I mean, anything that they can use um, that goes through their nose and through their brain uh, to find that deer, they're going to use it. And I'm sure there is a lot of stuff that they're using that we don't have a clue about. Um, we think we know, oh yeah, my dog's smelling this. Well, you don't know, um, you know, it's even, like I said, even broken vegetation, they know what it smells like where deer stepped in grass versus where they didn't. Um, just, it's truly amazing. It's just, it's mind blowing stuff when you, when you think about it. Oh right. yeah. And, and you think, think about some of those deer we track, they're 24 to 48 hours old and how many, how many deer cross that deer's path. And they can figure that out. They stay on that original track, you know, and, and again, that takes a trained dog to do that. Yeah. 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 No, I always like, cause I've had instances where I've shot one deer and then here comes a doe walking by two. And it's like, well, I, I'm going to fill two tags today, you know, <laughs> and you do it. And then, uh, I, I can imagine, have you guys ever had anything like, where it was actually somebody shot two deer and the paths were getting crossed or anything like that. That that can be a little bit of a nightmare. I've had that happen. I think Gary, you probably have two, haven't you? Yep. Yep. Yeah. I've had three shot from the same tree. <laughs> yep. can, can you tell the story on that one or no? <laughs> um, no. <laughs> well, I mean, I I don't know. I I guess it's legal. I've never done it. Um, I can only assume it's legal if you've got three tags in your pocket. The, the guy, I think he shoots a small buck and a, and then a, a doe walks by, he shoots it, and he sees the doe fall over. And then of course the last year through in the night is a, is a bigger buck and he gut shoots it, you know? So I've got a small buck that we um, need to track and the, the bigger buck that we need to track. And in the meantime, there's, there's blood everywhere and I don't know what's what and he put all three of his arrows together. And so I don't know, even know what arrow goes to what deer. And so it was a little bit of a nightmare. <laughs> Did it turn out halfway? Okay. Um, we found the small deer. We found the small buck. We did not find the big, the big deer. <laughs> so. How did, uh, how did yours end up? Ron? Uh, I got to think about that. It's a few years back. Uh, I, I think we did get one of the deer. The other one didn't. I don't know if that one died or not. Honestly, I'd like to get feedback from a lot of the hunters when we do these trackings and some of them do, they, they'll let you know, but some of them just forget, you know, if they see the deer or find it later. So, so, I mean, is that kind of like a common practice? Do you guys pretty much ask them like, Hey, let me know if we don't find this deer and you end up getting trail cam pictures or something, because I know that Gary never found out. I, I have a friend who ended up using him. And from what I understand, you guys went, put on some serious miles that day, trying to track that deer. And, um, and, and you, you ended up talking to me and telling me about, yeah, we just went on this real long track. And I go, oh, really? I just had buddy that did it. <laughs> and turns out it was the same guy. And then, um, yep. You're like, man, I don't know if that deer was dead or alive or not. And turns out that the deer was alive. And, and my buddy showed me quite a few trail camera pictures of it. And he's still around this year so far. Oh, cool. So just so you know. Yeah, he, can he track is him still again. around. Yeah. <laughs> they still be and, like, and I, yeah, I know this guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's kind of an evaluation. You know, it helps us out, you know, and it gives us peace of mind, too. Because, you know, we don't want to leave that deer out there dead. So. If we get that feedback, you know, it's it's kind of two things at once there, evaluating there, the dog and then it's peace of mind as well. Yeah. There are some there are some tracks that haunts us. So that, that kind of sounds like you're driving back. You're driving back and you're like, I don't know. Diesel wasn't on his game tonight. And I geez, did I should I went left there and should I should I went around the cattails the other way and you start second guessing. And you're like, God, I hope I, this guy doesn't call me a couple of days from now and finds this deer. I mean, it, it, it literally it keeps you up at night and it haunts you. That's Absolutely. how bad we want to find deer. Um, we take a personal when we leave one, and, and it's not something we take lightly. It's it's a big deal. Um, it's going to happen, but it's a big deal. Um, so there's when when a hunter, um, um, you know, sends us a text. Um, saying, Hey, guess who showed up? It's like, yeah, I knew we were right. Uh, but, and it, and it helps us learn to go back to reading your dog. 
how did diesel do on that track? Why did he confuse me? Um, you know, was his body language really telling me that he thought the deer was dead? You know, did I miss something? You know, so there's, you worry about that stuff. So I, Ron, I know, I know Gary, uh, is probably like the football coach and he, he records a lot of, a lot of his tracks and I'm sure he goes over that footage again and, and, you know, it haunts him and he goes, goes through the play by play by play. Is that something that you kind of do too, or is it like a common practice or, or no? I, I don't, I don't record any of my tracks. You know, I do, I do a, a, a log sheet and document everything I can, you know, and, and keep track of it that way. But as far as the video, I, I haven't done that. There's a few times where I pulled my phone out and used the phone, but as far as using a GoPro or anything, I haven't, that, haven't done that myself yet. Hmm. And, and if but there's that, one track for across the United States that should have a camera on his chest, it's not <laughs> Slifer. And my daughter is so, so upset because they got me a GoPro. I just haven't incorporated it yet. You got to get yeah. one of those cool vests, the tracker vests like Gary's got that. Yep. <laughs> Mounted to yeah. it. That is cool. That is cool. <laughs> Um, I remember <laughs> I, Luke. I, I will say that um, Ron and Dio are no, sh- no short um, um, of heart pounding moments. Let me tell you, those those yeah. those two have some pretty cool adventures together. I will say that. I remember Ron's a character, and, and and so is Dio. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when you pulled up Gary, and you you pull out this bin, and you start putting on all this stuff, and I'm like, geez, this guy looks like he's ready to go into <laughs> freaking battle over here. <laughs> yeah, you know everything, hey, but you know it. what? I gotta hey. say, you never know what you're gonna be going through, right? So Ron yeah. wears a helmet. Yeah, Ron wears yeah. a helmet. What's it's it's no know, joke. Yeah, and, and you know, wear a helmet, got brush gear because. We're going to be going through brush, and like I said, we might cross a creek, or who knows what. You know, you just never know what you got, what train you're going to get into, and you're essentially going into battle. Like you said, it better be prepared, or otherwise you're going to come out bloody. Yeah, no, I, I get it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, I just kind of wanted to ask you guys um, one more time, just kind of, it's the Illinois Deer Tracker Trackers Network, and then just go over before we kind of get off the get off the interview here. Just tell everybody what it is one more time and where they can find it and uh, how, you know, how they can get a hold of you guys if they actually need your services. I'll yeah. handle so it's you, Gary. Yep. If it, it's the Illinois Deer Trackers Network, we can be found at um, on Facebook, Illinois Deer Trackers Network. We've got a Facebook page and a Facebook group. And again, the impetus behind um, the, the entire network is um, to link um, hunters with quality and known tracking themes across the state and grow the sport of tracking um, um, and and, and grow the the number of of quality tracking teams um, in Illinois. What are really are are, are the the end game is really what we want to do is um, um, increase um, the, um, the confidence level of hunters get more hunters utilizing a, a quality tracking team um, um, and, and, and stop leaving uh, recoverable deer in the woods. Um, and that's, that's, that's really our goal. So in, increase uh, the, the, the quality of tracking in the state um, from a tracking tracker's perspective and, and increase the, um, the confidence level that hunters have um, um, in us. And, and, and again, eliminate the guesswork we're doing the guesswork for you when you call uh, an in-network team you know what you're going to get so real quick i just popped into my head um but it kind of i think it's probably pretty important now but can you kind of tell people what they should be doing um as far as not to screw up a track or something like that um so so it makes your guys's job easier when they get out there you mind me going, Gary? All you, buddy. Okay. So what I generally tell guys after they shoot the deer, the best thing to do is wait. You know, a lot of times they'll get down on the stand, which I, I get it. Sometimes when you shoot a deer, you think you got a good shot, but it may not be the case sometimes. And waiting is the most critical thing. A lot, of the, a lot of the hunters that call me will say they've got into the track 100, 150 yards, and they bump the deer up. And that's the worst thing then because, 
what you've done, generally that deer, if it's bedded for a little bit of time, it's probably quit bleeding. So they're, they're not gonna be able to visually track it. So waiting is very critical after the shot. Uh, how long to wait, it just depends on the shot, of course, but uh, at least a minimum of a couple hours, I would think, you know, just give that deer some time, give it more than an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, and if you pursue that track, keep it to a minimum on the people going out, the hunter himself and maybe one other individual, and then walk along the blood trail. Don't walk on the, the blood trail itself because what what will happen, you'll pin a, pick up the scent particles on your shoes. And when you lose that blood trail and start wandering around, it could mislead a dog. It, so I'm saying the scent particles stick to the shoes and you're tracking around. And so that becomes an issue. Yeah. Um, and then also you want to get permission from all your neighboring landowners uh, before we get there, you know, before you get a guy with a dog. Because you got to have permission to go on the property, neighboring property. You just can't be trespassing on people's ground. So that's going to help out a lot. Get that permission ahead of time because you don't know how far that deer is going to go. Yeah. And that's you think actually, I'm missing there, Gary? That's, that's actually what I did. Ahead. I don't know if Gary told me that or not. I can't recall. But, I mean, I did go around, I know, and talk to some people and say, hey, I don't know. I shot a deer. It could have left all this property and went on to your property. And really, it did, and it didn't go far at all. <laughs> um, about 80 yards. <laughs> But, yeah. you know, it happens, right? And so that's something you want to be yeah. prepared about. And like like you said, that's become one of my rules of thumb even long before. And Gary was like, well, why'd you wait? You know, and I said, because it's just, I mean, it's what I do. You got to give that deer time no matter what, because you never know how yeah. your shot was. And that's something I think everybody should truly implement is if you don't see, physically see that deer go down and there and, you go. and drop and be dead, give it time. Give it a couple hours minimum before you even start looking. I know a lot of people, you know, they're probably afraid to try and search in the dark or something like that. But, I mean, like you said, you got the option of calling the Illinois Deer Trackers Network and, and getting a deer and, and, and doing that. I mean, is Gary, is there anything you want to add to that? No, I think, you know, I, if, I think if you pull every tracker across the United States and they say, what's the biggest mistake you see hunters make? I'll bet you ninety-five percent of the trackers will say they don't wait long enough. Yeah. Yes. One thing I will will add to that, and Gary will attest to this, is when you're out there visually tracking before you call a tracker, is to mark that point of loss with something very obvious. Uh, we'll have hunters mark it with a stick where they've lost blood, and then we'll come out there and try to find that <laughs> stick in the middle of the woods at night, and we're spending two hours trying to find that stick amongst how many other sticks. So it's pretty important, you know, toilet paper works well or something man-made or something really obvious where that point of loss is saves a, a lot of time. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. <laughs> if I, I think a bow hunter could, or any hunter really, deer hunters, but a bow hunter especially, I, th I think they could do themselves a lot of good if they, if they study just two or three different shot scenarios that aren't double long or part long or you know your your normal if if a guy can recognize what a zero looks like it smells like on a liver hit looks like and smells like on a gut hit what's usually there on the ground with liver or guts what's the deer's behavior on liver or guts what's the deer's behavior if they were hit through the back straps versus a leg if they can recognize those things that would just that would help them make better decisions and recover more deer even without a dog um, yeah. but you know just a little bit of homework it would, would go a, a long way in terms of put more deer in the freezer. Yeah, I will say, though, I will say that uh, mine kind of had you confused because you asked what was there, and I told you, and, I, and you go, ooh, I don't know. That doesn't seem too good. And I'm like, no, I'm going to tell you right now, I know <laughs> <laughs> where I hit on the deer. I saw it hit, and I know this. And yeah. you were probably thinking, yeah, okay, yeah, right, you know. And then because <laughs> – like I said, there was belly hair, and you're like, oh, no, that's a real low shot. And I go, oh, no, I hit him pretty high. <laughs> and you're like, well, where, you know, how high up were you in the tree? And then I told you, you're like, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it kind of had sick you. Just looking at the stand, never mind being in it. It, it had you confused, and, you know, but, but it, turned out, it turned out pretty good, in which was, it, the whole thing was kind of surprising that that it did last as long as it did. But I mean, it just goes to show that they're a tough animal and, and uh, 
you definitely yeah. shouldn't go in rushing in after him trying to find him like that. It, it you know, yeah. and what did I go like t- maybe twenty yards and I backed I backed out because yeah. I knew smartest thing you did. I just knew something it was nobody. Right. Yeah, you can't argue at this point, and and Gary will definitely agree with this. Anybody should, but a dead deer goes nowhere. You know, if it's dead out there thirty minutes later, it's still going to be dead there an hour later. You yep. know, so waiting's a good thing, really. Yeah, you know, Luke, on your deer, we found your deer a lot. It well, did. I, I I don't remember how much time we gave your deer, but it was you about know, six and a half possi- hours. It was about six yeah. and a half hours, I think. You know, if if I didn't come to your place, meet you, and then ditch you and go to lunch and come back <laughs> um there's a possibility where I'm, I'm really shocked that your deer didn't have enough gas in the tank to get up and go and if he did that's gonna that's a game changer that's not a huge piece of property out there yeah you know that's that could have been bad um yeah. if if we jumped him and he had enough gas in the tank to put a mile and a half on us we're done yeah for sure yeah yep so, so um, in, you got anything else you guys want to add to that? Or? I don't know. I don't believe so. All right, man. I, I appreciate you guys coming on, talking about it. Illinois Deer Trackers Network. And like Gary said, find you guys on Facebook. Hopefully, maybe soon a website coming um, yep. next season. Who knows? Maybe even an app developed. Gary, we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, Gary, you ready for an app? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much, Ron, Gary. Thank you for coming on and talking about thank it. You. I think it's a good thing Thanks to educate us, people. Luke. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenge.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show.